If you would, open your Bibles and stand with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, as we stand together for the reading of the Scriptures this morning. Probably a fairly familiar passage to most of you. It's a unique passage in that we'll find out in just a second. Something is mentioned for the very first time in the Bible. And as we begin reading, Matthew chapter 16, begin at verse number 13 with me. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You can be seated. That'll be our scripture text for the next couple of weeks, by the way. And so as we start looking at, at the church, the uh, ecclesia or the ecclesia, however you want to pronounce that, that's the Greek word that's used there for the word church. This is the first time in the scriptures that the word church has been used. And so let me just kind of show you the, the situation that the uh, apostles find themselves in and what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, and as he's coming back into Matthew 16, if you've been with us on Sunday nights, you found out that Jesus and the twelve went on a, a Gentile tour. They had crossed over the sea. They had gone from the Sea of Galilee to the other portion. They'd gone to Tyre and Sidon. They'd gone all the way up around. Then they made that north loop. Remember, they went north, and then they came east. They ripped all the way back down around Decapolis. And then after they came to Decapolis, they set sail to go to the other side. During that time, the Lord has done um, an awful lot of teaching. We found out that more than likely it was about three or four months, possibly even longer, that he had spent with his disciples in this Gentile land. Remember, they were surrounded by all the pagan idols and all the temples and all of the uh, false gods that were going, and he was teaching them along the way. What he was teaching them was very vital to them because what he had done is shown them that he came into his own and his own received him not. Therefore, he's going to take this message, which has always been the plan of God. Remember that. Don't ever forget that, that the entire world should hear the gospel. And so he takes them to the Gentile region, and he begins to show them I'm going to also redeem Gentiles. And during that time, he did that tremendous miracle. Remember, across the Sea of Galilee, he fed 5,000 at least. And we know men and women and children and all the others. So uh, scholars and mathematicians have come up with the number could have been anywhere from twenty to 25,000. I don't know. I can tell you this. There were 5,000 men. You say, how do you know that? The Bible says so. And it's not wrong, so I'm fine on that one. Uh, and, but it does say there were women and children there, so we at least know there's 5,001 because the lad came, right? And women's plural, so maybe 5,003. I don't have a clue. But then we found out that after months of that, he had the same situation arise in Gentile territory, and the disciples were kind of wondering, well, is he going to do the same for these people? Did you remember that phrase? These people. And the answer is he had more food, less, less people, and yes, he fed them. And he gathered more up after the feeding, we found out, because of the word used for baskets. And so all of this is going on, and then Jesus sets sail with his disciples back over across the sea, and he's met by that wonderful welcoming committee, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees asking the first thing right off the bat is, show us a sign. 
And uh, he told them, yeah, we're not going to deal with the sign thing. The disciples were all upset because they were talking about bread again. They had just left, and guess what? The Bible says, and we'll show it to you tonight in our, our Mark study, that they had forgotten the bread. Remember, they had seven baskets, and we found out it wasn't the little baskets like they've got with the uh, feeding of the 5,000. That was small lunch pails. This one says the word basket that's used where they let Paul down out of the city with. So it's obviously big enough basket to carry a human in. And so they left the baskets, and they get to the other side, and they're, they're all upset about, we don't have nothing but this one little loaf. Well, you know, they're not even talking, you know, good French bread. They're, they're talking about the little cracker thing, and that's their loaf. And so Jesus comes to them and goes, guys, you're not getting it. Why are you worried about food? I, I can hand me that cracker. You know, he could have taken that cracker right then and did the same thing he's done before. When he said, I've told you to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, I wasn't literally talking about they're going to mess up your cooking. They're going to they're gonna put some leaven in your bread and it's going to rise. And that. No, I'm talking about their doctrine. And then they began to understand that he had warned them about the doctrine of the Pharisees. Now watch this. He did not warn them about the doctrine of of the Gentiles. Now he has moved up to Caesarea Philippi. You say, why are you saying all that? Watch what happens here. As he goes up to Caesarea Philippi, that is one of the most idolatrous regions there is. In Caesarea Philippi was the Temple of Pan. Paul, throw that up there. The Temple of Pan. That's what it looks like today. What's left over from it. The Greeks had come in. It had once time been the Temple of Baal. But the Greeks had come in and made it the Temple of Pan, the fertility god. The god who was going to uh, come in. You, you know Pan. He's the one that is half goat, half man. You, you got him? Yeah. Uh, he was the god of fertility. And, and so he came in, and they would capture people. And they believed he slept in that cave. They believed he was born in that cave. They believed that the gods of fertility at wintertime went into that. There's a cave that associates with it. And so what they did is they didn't want to tick off any gods. So on the backside of that, Brother Paul, on the backside of that, they made a bunch of niches to any other false god they could find. And those are still there today. You, so Jesus, this is where he's at. Okay, I want you to get this in your mindset. He says, watch out for these Pharisees. And then he goes on and says, but look where I'm standing. I'm standing in front of false idols. I'm standing in front of paganism. I'm standing in front of the one of the most worshipped idols around that has taken over this, uh, this temple. And on the backside, just beside these little temple things, there's a big opening that water used to flow out of. The water flew out of it so fast that they used to take prisoners and throw them in the water, and if they floated, they weren't guilty. Don't know if I like that, that law or not, amen? There's rocks and stuff galore. Uh, and so that's what it looks like. Today, it's what it looks like. Today, they cut the river off, the water flow off, and they sent it to another area so that the water would flow a little bit better. Paul, show us the next picture. They called that right there the gates of hell. Got it? That is the source or the mouth where that water comes out of the gates of hell where they believe the demons and, and stuff of the underworld. That's where their gods went to sleep at night. They went to the gates of hell, the gates of the underworld, the gates of Hades. That's where the Jordan River starts. That's the mouth of the Jordan River flowing out of 72 different springs that come out from under the mountains of Mount Hebron, and they flow there. And they would take animal sacrifices and throw it in there. People said that the, that portion of the water always looked blood red because of sacrifices to their false gods, because of a uh, judicial system of, of capital punishment, and human sacrifices as well. And so it was known as the gates of hell. That is where you could take, and that's where all of the false gods went, and that's where they demand, their domain was. Now remember what he just said. Spoiler alert, I'm jumping about two weeks ahead of my sermon. He says the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. All false doctrine, all false gods, all false beliefs, all sacrifices, all paganism. They even expressed at the Temple of Pan uh, prostitution and bestiality. None of that is going to come and defeat the church. The gates of hell, no matter what they were, they will not. So he's standing in front of the gates of hell when he makes the statement about the gates of hell. 
So now you see where the situation is coming in. And so as he's got that situation under control, letting them see everything that's happening, this is going to be one of the major turning points in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's going to reveal an awful lot of stuff in just a few, a few statements. But it's where he's at, when he's doing it, how he's doing it, and with whom he's doing it. He begins by asking a question. I guess this is the disciples' final exam. They have been on this Gentile tour for months now, and uh, I guess it's going to be like a little essay, you know. I'll ask you one question, and you spill your guts. I love those kind of tests. Don't give me where i got to figure it out. Just, just a, here's the question, tell me everything you know. Amen? I can, I can write, uh, 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 I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. Now, Zach, on the other hand, he goes, it was a very, 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 very you know, he tries to go with, you know, it doesn't work that way. But the end, and he says, let me ask you a question. It's a two-part question, but let me ask you this. Listen to the question he asked. Who do men say that I the Son of Man, am. Did you catch the question he asked? Who, that phrase, Son of Man, is a phrase for the Messiah. He's asking this question, basically. Who do people say that I, the Messiah, am? He just said what? I am the Messiah. Take a survey amongst society and see what society thinks of me. Now, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of Man. He just revealed that to them. He's already said it on several other occasions, but he has said it to them now. They on several occasions have said, we think we found the Messiah. Okay, we got the Messiah thing going here. What do the multitudes, though, say about me? What does this society that regions around us say about what do the gentiles say about me what do the jews say about me what do the pharisees say about me let's put a man on the street and find out who the they think me the messiah the son of man who do they think i am they gave several answers some said uh well we we think he's john the baptist that's interesting they obviously didn't know a whole lot about John the Baptist because he baptized Jesus. Now, that would have been difficult. Then some who didn't obviously know who he was, they thought maybe he's, he's come and he's the one who's preaching like John the Baptist. And remember, John the Baptist came and he was calling for a national repentance. He was the preparer of the way for the Messiah. But some people were thinking, no, he might be the, the, the real McCoy. He might be the one who's coming on. And so he, he preaches like John. In fact, he preached the exact same message as John the Baptist, didn't he? See, I told you it's okay for a preacher to use other preachers' messages. He preached the exact same message of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some say he's Elijah. Well, man, Elijah was known for one thing, miracles. He was a miracle-working guy. Maybe he, we see all the miracles he's doing. Maybe he is Elijah. And by the way, didn't the Old Testament, which is all they had at that time, didn't it say that Elijah was going to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord? And didn't the Lord answer that about John the Baptist? He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And some say you're you're Jeremiah or or one of the other prophets. You see, they believed Jeremiah had taken the Ark of the Covenant and hid it. And that just before the Messiah comes, he's going to pull that back out and say, okay, here we go. Maybe you're Jeremiah. Maybe that, that phrase is who you are. And by the way, we've seen you cry a bunch. And Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Maybe you're one of those. And as wonderful as those guys are in the Scripture, to say that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is one of them, is devaluing him. Remember what he said? A greater than Solomon is here. John the Baptist is a wonderful character in the Bible, or a person in the Bible. Character almost sounded like it's a fairy tale, didn't it? He's an, a wonderful person of history, but he's not Jesus Christ. Elijah was great. I mean, he kind of got swept up. Amen. Swing low. I mean, what a way. Amen. But he's no Jesus Christ. Jeremiah was amazing. 
the weeping prophet. And we're studying a little bit about Jeremiah uh, on, on uh, our prison tour here. And we're finding out about his imprisonment. But listen, he even wrote about the new covenant during the old covenant times. But listen, he's no Jesus Christ. And may I say to you this morning, there's a lot of preachers you look up to, a lot of them you'll miss church for, a lot of them you'll make sure you get got to get out. That's wonderful for good preaching and fellowship. That's wonderful. But they're no Jesus Christ. And I may as well say this, in case you're wondering, me either. I think I proved that to you 28 years ago. Boy, he ain't no Jesus Christ. But at least we know what we got, so we can't mess up again, right? So here we are, and the question is, who do men say I am? But again, he was asking, who do they say the Messiah is? And to do that brings him down. And then he asked the follow-up. The follow-up question is a question that will be answered by every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever breathed air into their lungs. This is the question of eternity. This is the question that draws everything down and gets rid of preference, opinion, partiality, justice, judgment, equality, equity. It gets rid of all of it. Nothing, listen to me, nothing else matters in all of the world than this question. Who do you say that I am? But whom say ye that I am? Now notice, he shortened that question a little bit. He didn't refer to himself as the Messiah again, did he? He had already done that. Who do men say I, the Son of Man, the Messiah, am? Well, let me... Let me ask you guys this. Who do you think I am? And Peter makes that great confession. And by the way, I'll uh, insert this for you. This great confession is also what we'll find out from the, another portion of Scripture in just a moment. It is the foundation of the church. This is what the church is founded upon. If it's not founded upon this, then we, we got big, big troubles. In fact, spoiler alert, I'll go ahead and give you another verse of Scripture that uh, we'll be looking at in the next couple of weeks. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's what the Apostle Paul said. There's a mystery out there. We, we know about the mystery. Well, what is the mystery? Well, right now, God the Father is fixing to reveal part one of the mystery. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said in verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Greek word for Christ is the same as the Hebrew word for Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one that God said was going to come. You are the Messiah who's going to come as King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one who's going to come and redeem the world. You are the one who's going to set up and rule and reign. You are the one. You are the Christ. To say the Christ was to say you're the Son of Man. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And all this time you thought it was his last name. Joseph and Mary Christ, right? Jesus Christ the Son of the living God. Notice, Peter adds to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the Messiah. Peter said, you are. You, we believe you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of Man. And you're also, as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That just went a step beyond saying, we're not sure how this Messiah is going to come. Now, we look back at Scripture, and we find out it's going to be God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. But they weren't for sure of all of those things right just yet. They were finding it out, and they were finding it out right now. To be the Messiah means we believe you're God in the flesh. And because you're God in the flesh, let me say something else. We believe before you became flesh... You are the eternal, living Son of Almighty God. You were God before the flesh. You were God before the world. You were God before you said, let there be light. You are God. We believe that. Listen, that's the foundation of the church. 
that confession. What does this church believe? We believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ. He is the Messiah who came and died for our sins, was rose again, ascended into heaven, and will come again in glory. We believe that about the Messiah. But we also believe He is the eternal God who became flesh and dwelt among us. You say, well, uh, there's a lot of stuff different churches believe. Listen, if they don't believe that, listen to me, they have no reason to exist. When He said, I believe you're the Christ, He just said, I believe you fulfill over 400 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. In our scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, I believe you are the Christ. You are the one who a virgin shall conceive. You are the one whose name is Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You are the one that's going to be born in Bethlehem. You are the one who is the son of... You are the one in Genesis 3 who's going to crush the head of Satan. You are that Christ. We believe that. You see, it, it, what can one statement actually say? When we say we believe he's the Christ, then you've got to look at what the Christ has done. And I believe everything my Bible says about him. I believe exactly what my Bible says about him. I do not try to rationalize it. Sometimes I don't understand it. But like I've told you on numerous occasions, I don't understand electricity, but it don't sit in the dark. I can flip a switch and know it works. Listen, I don't understand everything about God and Christ, but I'm not foolish enough to not accept him and understand that he will teach me all things. We believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So now he's made that confession. And now comes the revelation. The revelation is found in verse number 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven isn't it amazing when you make a revelation statement and you're not even sure where it came from Peter said here's what we believe in our hearts how do you believe that in your heart because God revealed it to me and how do I know when God reveals something to me it's true it's consistent with his word that's the only way I know. And everything they saw in Jesus, and everything they had witnessed him do, and all the things that had happened, they realized. Our scripture says this is the Messiah. Remember one of the great miracles? We'll touch on it tonight again. The healing of the blind. Do you realize there was not one blind man healed until Jesus came? Look. That was going to be, according to Isaiah, that was going to be one of the signs of the Messiah. He was going to heal blinded eyes. Elijah never healed a blind eye. Elisha never healed a blind eye. Moses, Daniel, David, none of the judges. He touched blind eyes. He must be the Messiah. He's walked on water. <laughs> He must be the Messiah. He is the Messiah, and we believe that. And Jesus said, you're right. Notice he did not refute anything he said. We believe thou art the Christ. If he wasn't the Christ, he'd have said what? No, 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 that's, no, I'm not. We believe you're the son of the living God. No, 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 I'm not the... Yes, you're right. In fact, he goes on to confirm it by saying, my Father in heaven told you. He revealed it to you. I believe you're the Son of God. That's because Daddy told you I was. In the heart and the mind of Peter and the disciples, they had finally realized Jesus Christ is God. He that has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's true. 
All this stuff you said, it's true. How do I know? Because God the Father revealed it unto me. God the Son said, you're exactly right. And so therefore, it must be true. And now we move to the next part. And this will be the last part of the sermon today, Brother Paul. I know you're looking on. I got 25 other slides. That's why I said it's a, it's a coming. Amen. Verse number 17. The possession. And I say unto thee, after Peter just made that great confession, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. My church. Please understand the next statement I'm fixing to say. Take a deep breath because it's going to rattle some of your cages. The word my is more important than the word church. You say, wait a minute now, Brother Rick. I, I don't know what you say. Watch. Watch and see what I mean. Jesus made a little play on words, by the way, right there. He said, thou art Peter. He used the word Petros, which means small, shifting, rolling, unstable pebbles. But upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock himself upon myself and the confession that you just made of who i am that's what my church is going to be built on you know what he was saying that's a large unmovable stable greek word solid rock you know what he said he said pebble peter <laughs> my church is going to be built on mount messiah i am the rock and I, that confession of who i am will build my church. Now, I told you a minute ago, that's the first time the word church is used in the Bible. And so all of a sudden, it, it must mean something mystical, magical, because there are so many churches out there. The word ecclesia or ecclesia, what does it mean? It means a called out assembly. It means a bunch of people who agree on a purpose, getting together. You know, forget which one it is. It's the first week of each month. Is it Tuesday or Thursday nights? The 4-H club meets over here. They, they have ecclesia. What? They have a gathering for one purpose. That's it. When the local... Lodge meets, the elks, the mooses, the geeses, the ducks, I don't care what they are. They meet. That's their ecclesia. That's their gathering. It doesn't have to be a spiritual word. It's not a spiritual word. In fact, it was used in the Scripture as a secular word. Remember in Acts chapter 20 when the crazy crowd is going nuts, screaming, Great is Diana of, of, of the Ephesians, and the whole crowd is circling Paul and the fellas? It says that the moderator stood up and said to the crowd, This is an ecclesia. This is a called solemn assembly. We've gathered together as citizens for one purpose. When politicians have a rally, they're having an ecclesia. It's rattling your cage, isn't it? Because you want to use the word church. And it's okay. I just hate to think for a second that some of our politicians are having church. They need to have church, but they don't have a church. Not with some of the things they're saying. So, what are you saying, Brother Rick? It's a called out, set aside assembly of people who have gathered together with one purpose. Okay, And he says, the Father hath revealed that to you about my Christ. Now, I'm revealing to you the other part of that mystery, the church. The church, that great assembly together. Well, then what makes this place and this assembly different from when the 4-H'ers meet? Same buildings. Are they having church? 
in the strictest of sense of the word ecclesia? Yeah. They're having church, and the purpose of their gathering is to find out about agriculture. That's why I said ecclesia is not the key word. My is the key word. When the four H's meet next door in our buildings, they're meeting for a whole different purpose than when we gather together, and our purpose is Him. My church, my possession, they belong to me. The ecclesia belongs to me. Not the building, the people. Well, what separates us from those of the secular world then? What is it that makes this ecclesia so different that we are being revealed by Christ that it's so special to Him? In fact, the Bible says that He gave Himself for His church. The Bible says the church is the bride of Christ. But which church? Which ecclesia? Mine. Well, how do we know if it's yours? Good question. Because we put his name on it. And so we must be his, right? We claim him, but he denies us. You don't believe that? Drive past the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They don't believe the same Jesus I believe in. That's not his ecclesia. That's not his church. Therefore, guess what's going to happen? The gates of hell will prevail against it. It's man-made. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I know you're out there. I hear you breathing. A couple snoring, but anyway. 1 Corinthians, Paul shows us the distinction. In chapter 1, verse 2, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Did you see what he just did? The church of God, those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. He equals them. Who is my church? What is the church of Corinth? What is the church of Clay Hill? What is the church of Maxville? What is the church of Middleburg? What is First Baptist? Denver? What are those churches? Those are those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. They gather together in a local spot. Their local spot was Corinth. Our local spot is Clay Hill. But guess what? Individually, we're saints. Collectively, we're the church. You understand that? Individually, you are. People go, well, no, the Roman Catholic Church didn't tell me I was a saint. I got one better. God did. My mom used to say, you're either a saint or an ain't. Amen? That's your only two choices. Notice when he tells them they're set apart, the purpose they're set apart. Remember, it's like-minded people dwelling together for a common purpose. If that common purpose is not that we believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If that's not the purpose, then guess what? It's a club. It's an organization. You can have ecclesia all over the place, but you can't have his church without the ingredients. And the ingredients are those saints who are set apart, meeting together in a local place for what purpose? We believe that thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And if we believe that, what will we be doing? We'll be teaching all things whatsoever He's commanded us. What will we be doing? We'll be going into all the world and preaching the gospel. If we believe that, we will be baptizing those in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we believe that, we'll be studying the Scriptures. If we believe that, we'll have fellowship one with another. If we believe that, we'll be reaching out to our community. If we believe... You see, that one confession is the foundation. Because once you say He's the Christ, guess what? That means He's your Master. And everything the Master said, do. And if that's not good enough, He's God. And if God said, do it, then do it. And I believe that, therefore I'm part of His church. Now notice this, though. He said something very unique. He said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
Yet Brother Red just wrote another song the other day. He said, I saw another church for sale. Wait a minute. Brother from Black Creek's here this morning. Good to have you all with us. And I'm sure he's seen letters of churches closing, congregations folding, going away. Some because of sin, some because of neglect, some because of financial problems. Some that folks just got too old and they couldn't have church anymore and there wasn't a plan for the future. And some, there's all kind of reasons. But listen to this statement. Jesus never promised your church will continue to survive in society. But he did promise his church will never fail. So what do you mean, Brother Rick? I love this phrase. I wish I'd have come up with it. (laughs) A congregation may go under, but the church will go upper. You see, because the church, the ecclesia, is made up of saints. And those saints collectively are the church of the living God. Notice Jesus is now going to stop talking about the kingdom of God as much. He's going to start talking about the church. It's that called out group in Christ Jesus who meet together to stir their belief and have one purpose, to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way to become a member of the church of God, I didn't say Clay Hill Baptist, I said the church of God, is to ask Christ to be your Savior. To make that same confession that Peter made. I believe thou art the Christ. And to believe that he's the Christ, you believe that he died for your sins. You believe that he rose again. You believe he has ascended into the Father. You believe he has placed his own blood on the mercy seat in glory. And the Father has said, forgiven. You believe that. If you don't, you're not part of the church. And it's not this building. This is our local church. This is the ecclesia, the church. Notice, it's the church of Corinth. It's the church of Ephesus. It's the church of Philippi. It's the church of Clay Hill. This is where we meet. Why do we meet? Because we're His. And being His makes a strong confession to this community. We are the church of the living God. Made up of saints set apart for the kingdom of God. And the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. I intend with every ounce of being I have that the church of Clay Hill will stay. But I do know this. The church that's currently meeting at Clay Hill will always be there. It's not our location. It's our relation with our Lord. How's yours this morning? What's your relationship like with Him? Do you love Him enough to become part of the church? And if you're part of the church, do you love Him enough to be the church of the living God? Because the Great Commission was given to the church. All of the blessings that flow that were piled in that we see happening all good things come from every perfect gift coming from above to his saints his saints who together make up my church jesus said somebody asked me <laughs> a long time ago well how's your church doing brother rick i said it's gone under amen if it's mine We got problems, folks. We got real problems. But if it's his, it's going up. One day with a shout. Amen. Let's pray together. Father.